I'm Justin Evangelo. This is Disenabled, the podcast where we enable people with physical disabilities. Happy to be back for episode 10. Finally made it to double digit episodes. Thank you for sticking with me if you have since episode one throughout all the inconsistencies. Back at it again with another episode a little bit sooner than obviously my regular posting schedule. And, of course, I hope to keep it up. Part two of my conversation with the blind snowboarder hoping to one day win a gold medal at the Paralympics, Emily Trepanier. This part of the conversation starts off with us talking about the ever-present topic of the pandemic that's dominated the mainstream for the better part of two years and how it's impacted her ability to hit the slopes as much as she would like, and some of the mental struggles that have gone on with that. Without any further ado, enjoy. Because of the pandemic, how have you actually stayed in tip-top Olympic shape (laughs) over the last year and a half? I imagine it hasn't been easy. It hasn't been easy, but we've made it work. So when the pandemic first hit I was still living in Ontario so um, and so all of our gyms and stuff were closed down obviously at the very beginning so Mm -hmm. we did a lot of virtual training we had to like pivot pretty quickly from in-person to virtual training which had its challenges but it worked for a while and then I made the move in early summertime out here to BC and we continue doing virtual training for a little while. So I would be, I would train with my coaches. They would be in Ontario and I would be in BC and we would use like Zoom and stuff like that. And then it got to the point where they thought it was starting to get a little bit challenging to get me to like work as hard as I needed to work. So we actually um, ended up looking for new gym coaches out here in BC. So we went through the um, Canadian Sport Institute, which is like, it's a big organization that like helps out athletes and stuff. And they actually have their own programs as well. Um, So at that time, our gyms out in BC were actually opening up again. So we could do like in-person gym training. So I ended up finding a a private studio out here in British Columbia and I reached out to them and told them about what I was doing and they were so excited to meet me. We actually like met within like a week of emailing back and forth. We actually met um, because our gyms were open. We were able to do in-person training with them. So um, man, that's a fast turnaround, right? (laughs) Yeah. And then also, Uh, So I was supposed to be joining the race team that I'm on now last season. And then it was all like set up and ready to go. And then a whole bunch of restrictions came in place. So they ended (laughs) up basically canceling the season. Um, There was like a small little skeleton crew of a few people that tried to get us out. But it was so hard to get a lot of snow time last season so um that was pretty upsetting to like because we were all set to go and everything I was so excited to be joining this race team and then all of a sudden it was like no well we're gonna have to wait for another year I'm like no wow (laughs) so you I mean you were sort of kind of green for the last 18 months of not hitting snow like yesterday was the first time Basically, yeah. So you can imagine how like <laughs> excited and how emotional that was for me because like it's been it was a long time, like you said. And then I suddenly I got to finally get on snow yesterday, and it was it was amazing. I was so happy to be back on snow. Um, and actually, we had a little bit of a scare a few weeks ago because they said we were going to actually be delayed to like mid-February and then about a week like about five days ago we got an email saying oh we got the green light we're gonna start racing this like race training this coming weekend I'm like it's like back and forth there you go something finally (laughs) broke your way that's awesome yeah Yeah. so it's like oh my god I was like as soon as I got that email I was (laughs) jumping around my apartment oh yeah (laughs) um 
it's been an emotional few years. Um, I didn't realize how hard it was going to be, but it's been hard these last few years. So hard. Um, but I've made it work, but it's just been, it's, it's definitely been quite the, like, like a change and like having to adapt and it, like things were constantly changing. So like one day we were able to do this and the next day we were like, oh, we can't do that anymore. So now what are we going to do? Right. So another cool thing is that I actually do stand up paddleboarding as my cross training sport in the summer months. So I was able to even though I couldn't get on snow a lot last season, I was able to still do stand up paddleboarding in my off, like in this, like the spring and the summer months. So I was able to still like work on some of those similar muscles and work on balance and stuff. So I was able to keep that up, but oh my goodness, it was so, it's been, it's been a hard one. This pandemic definitely has like delayed a lot of things and has forced us to like change and really like, think outside the box and adapt stuff so that it could still like I could still somehow keep up my training by making sure that we're like following all like the rules and all the restrictions that are in place so yeah that stand-up paddleboarding ought to keep you in shape I've seen people do that it does holy Christ yeah. (laughs) yeah it's so much fun but it is a lot of work especially so I started out on like a little like creek back in Ontario and then a few years ago um, my stand-up paddleboarding coach actually moved out here so I got approved to come out for about six weeks in the summer month to do stand-up paddleboarding on the ocean so you can imagine going from a small little creek stand-up paddleboarding to an ocean whole set of yeah, it's new like going challenges. to a kitty hill for sledding and then hitting a mountain in BC <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's been fun though. It's definitely kept up my muscles and it's definitely helped me keep up like working on my balance and stuff. So it's been, it's been amazing for that. So what drew you out to the West coast from Ontario? Oh, um, wow. So what a my... sigh. Okay. That tells me a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, so did stand so I got approved like I said to do stand up paddleboarding at West here. So I spent six weeks out here, and going into this, I was like, okay, I'm just going out west for six weeks, and then I'm gonna come home, and all is gonna be well, and it'll be good. I got out here, and I was like, I'm not going home. Oh, nice. <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, I don't know. I just it's it's beautiful out here. There's ocean close by there's uh, mountains close by there's a different vibe out here i don't know why (laughs) but um where i was staying there's a there's a it's called this is the seawall and so it goes right like you can walk right next to the ocean and it's just beautiful i I just fell in love with it and i was like no i don't want to go home but i had to go home because i had actually signed another year contract with where I was working at in Ontario and so I was so sad when I went home and I was like okay um what am I gonna do here you gotta tough it out (laughs) yeah so then what ended up actually happening is that um as luck would have it some of my race camps like more and more my race camps have actually been out on the west coast here in British Columbia um and there were times where we'd only be like it'd be a weekend race camp so we'd only be here like two or two to three days and then we'd have to like fly home not only is it like super expensive to just do a weekend here but it's also like the amount of like energy that i've had to like yeah like had to have and then going home and like dealing with like the, the, the the time change and everything it got really like it was pretty tiring so i was like what am i gonna do here um race camps are more and more at west i love it out there but uh what am i gonna do here and then so i had actually applied for um a position with one of the school boards out here just to see like i fully expected they wouldn't hire me on but um i had a few interviews and then they were like we want to hire you on i'm like okay there we go stars align there you go (laughs) 
I figured if they hired me on, it was a sign. So, what did all your Ontario <laughs> friends and family have to say about your permanent move to BC? Any reactions there? Um, they were surprised. They were very excited for me, but they were definitely surprised. My mom cried quite a bit, oh. but she was very proud of me, and she knew that. Um, if that's what I wanted to do, then then that's what I could do. But she was you can definitely tell she was she was sad that her youngest child was going <laughs> off like to BC. So everyone has been super supportive of my decision of moving out west here. Um, they're so happy and they see me how happy I am living out here. And so it it's been very positive overall. So did you make it back out there for Christmas? I did. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I've been home uh, a few times since I've moved out here. So, well, there you go. Must have been good to catch yeah. up with the family and everything like that. It was. Yeah. Yeah. It was really nice to catch up with family. And then this time when I went home for Christmas, since things were open a little bit more still, mm -hmm. I was able to see a few friends that I haven't seen for a few years too, as well. So that was really nice too. So. I've talked to some Paralympians who actually are in the in the Paralympics, and they do get some sort of payment for their training and everything. It doesn't sound like you do be you actually have a quote unquote day job. You and I have talked about it before. It's in the education field, so yeah. uh, you're you're just doing this on top of your job. How many hours? Yeah. How, like how many hours do you put in in a day? That's got to be some long, long, long days. Um, for training or like all told because I mean do you <laughs> like is it a full uh, full-time position as isn't is it an it educational is, yeah. assistant yeah so I'm a full-time educational assistant with one of the school boards out here and so after I'm done working most days I have training after so uh yeah busy days um definitely keeps me busy but I love it so and I definitely do enjoy when I get rest days. So those are definitely super important. And I have, especially over the last few years, been working on like self-care as well, just to make sure like I'm able to stay at like the top of my game. And um, but yeah, it's definitely busy, but I like it. I don't like to like stay at home and not do a lot. I I'm the type of person who actually loves getting out and being active. So it kind of works for me. Good. All right. Uh, yeah. Well, I guess you kind of have, have to have that temperament in order to actually pursue what you're doing. Yeah. Anyway, it's just a shame that it couldn't be your full-time job because of how much love you've actually shown towards it. Yeah. Um, I am working on getting more funding for my training, but it's, slow progress when I was in Ontario for the last few years that I was in Ontario I actually was had an Ontario uh, quest for gold carding card so I'm working on getting my Canada um, quest for gold carding in previous attempts to break through this sort of Paralympic barrier has anyone reached out for sponsorships or anything like that because I know if I had the cash I'd sponsor you <laughs> <laughs> Um, I actually had a few local sponsors in Ontario, um, it's like local stores that sponsored me and they're still like watching my adventure and like journey unfold, Sweet. but I'm always looking for like corporate sponsors to help out with training because it gets more and more expensive every year. Mm -hmm. So having a corporate sponsor would be, um, absolutely amazing and would be very, very helpful. Um, because right now I'm basically paying out of pocket and um, hey, okay. any sort of like fundraising that we're doing, it's basically going directly to that. So that's why I'm trying so hard to get my Canada carding and to find like a corporate sponsor to help with like but paying for training because it's expensive. <laughs> Out of pocket. Hear that? Nike and Coke. Jump on yeah. Emily's back and <laughs> throw her some dough. Starbucks. <laughs> Come on. 
Man, that can get yeah. expensive. And how, in terms of the technology, because again, I, I've I've listened to all your podcasts, and we'll get to that in a bit. But in yeah. terms of the technology for the speakers that you can put into your helmet which mm -hmm. I'll preface by saying that's how your guides communicate instead of yelling at you or having an uncomfortable yeah. clunky headset <laughs> on your head, which you've gone through as well. Yeah, Are th I have. Have, have those yeah. technologies been progressing e even since the pandemic started? Um, so the ones that I have right now are actually pretty amazing. I started with clunky headsets, like you said, underneath our headsets. And we would have to wear like thick hats and then put the headsets on so that it wouldn't like, hurt our ears yeah, or like because it would like skull. Trump, right? yeah, God. yeah and then i found actually uh, one a few years ago at a race camp i was introduced to the headsets that i have now and absolutely amazing no longer hurting our ears they just hide away in like our helmet pockets um the speakers hide away in there and then it's just like a little system that connects to it that like clips onto your helmet or whatever and it's a two-way system, and it's so much better. It's no longer hurting our ears or anything, so we're super happy about that. So I got these uh, like two years ago now. So I don't know if like technology has changed since, but I'm imagining it's constantly like it's constantly changing. But um, I'm loving the headsets that I have right now. I'm hoping they last a long time because I actually really like them. And you can like, instead of just like have having two people talk to each other, I can like the whole, my whole like group of coaches and guides can talk to us. So oh, wow. it's all not of us just all two at the same way. time. It can be so, multiple yeah. channels. That's yeah. There if I want to set up like that, so I can do it that way. So that's pretty cool. I didn't have those on my first ever headset set. So that's pretty cool. Well, there you go. No headaches, no migraines, no pressure no. on your freaking yeah. head so that yeah. you can safely not smack so your jaw into a tree or a fence. Yeah, exactly. So much better. <laughs> Did these speakers cost a lot? I'm just curious because no technology is uh, inexpensive um, anymore, obviously, right? One of the groups that I'm a part of, called it's called CADS. Um, it's Canadian Adaptive Snow Sports. Um, they actually do a discount for the organization. So I was able to get a discount for that. Um, so all together, I think they were around $300. Which... Not bad. I was expecting something mm -hmm. maybe closer to a thousand. All right. I know. I was thinking that too, but because of the discount, um, I think it, I think it took off a chunk of, uh, the amount that it would have been. So having that discount definitely helped a lot so was this technology specifically developed for the usage of adaptive snow sport athletes who had um, vision problems i think it was i don't think it was developed specifically for that but uh i know from doing my research and talking to a bunch of people a lot of like people who are doing skiing and snowboarding are actually using those headsets um now the company does the company is actually has a bunch of different headsets um so a lot of them are used for like mountain biking or like dirt biking so, so oh, then, true i didn't even think about that application so they can like so that those people can talk to like their friends and stuff or mm -hmm. whatnot so that's kind of what they're like the main thing is like that the company is but the there's a specific line that they have of headsets that are that you can use specifically that uh, people with who are who are skiing and snowboarding who are blind can use these headsets. And so um, I don't think they specifically made it for this particular reason, but it seems to be like a lot of people are gravitating towards them. So well, that'll get their popularity up, and hopefully the connotation will <laughs> actually help the publicity of blind snowboarding and other blind parasports. I hope so. Yeah, I hope so. I definitely made it a point to like tag them in a bunch of different posts that i've like there you go. posted so i'm hoping that it will help them in some way and maybe in the long run it, they'll help me more a little bit but we'll see <laughs> shout out to um what's the company you name who, who actually called, makes these things um they're called you clear 
All right. So U C L E A R. I might actually link some stuff about them in the description yeah, of this podcast. Might as well. Send, eh? <laughs> yeah, I can definitely send you their website. So when you're competing, are you competing against other people who are blind? So it depends. Um, depends if there are other people there who are blind, then I'll be competing against them. Otherwise, I'm competing against time and working on like. Uh, getting like personal bets and stuff mm -hmm. and um i have also competed against other of uh, like other abilities as well um that hasn't happened very often but it has happened once or twice where i've competed against a sit skier again that doesn't happen very often but um sometimes it's competing against other blind people and sometimes it's just, like a timed event it just depends what like the competition is and who's like at the races and stuff so so when you're competing at the Paralympics, hopefully sooner rather than later, what would be your <laughs> ideal setup for competition? What would you want to win gold in? What specifically would be the title of the sport? Um, so it's called Legally Blind Snowboarding, I believe. That's the classification. Okay. Um, so it, we would be competing against uh other blind snowboarders, but obviously since we're blind, we wouldn't all be on like, this like the race course at the same oh, time i know i don't want to like... see that <laughs> that's mean of me i'm sorry i feel like disaster <laughs> would strike if there were multiple blind snowboarders on the course i feel like a disaster would strike <laughs> it would be bad it would be a disaster i can just see it in my head right now and i'm like oh my goodness no <laughs> make for interesting play-by-play -play commentary oh my god <laughs> Can you imagine us trying to like get down the snow though and suddenly we hear someone be like You're already flying at Mach two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> turn left and as uh, and that person turns left, but their guide is like, No, 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 don't turn left, turn right. I didn't say turn left. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, especially if you have it a lapse just... in memory about direction, you know, you're left from <laughs> your right and everything. It would be utter chaos. It's no, that wouldn't work. <laughs> When you first started snowboarding, did you what what did you use any technology at all for guides? <laughs> how how did that work? No. No, I didn't. So my guides would have to literally yell at me going oh down God. the <laughs> What if you had to like layer up and you couldn't hear it through your helmet and then your toque? Oh my god. You just have to pray for the best. <laughs> How many uh, fence posts uh, or tree trunks did you oh, smack into over the years? Many? Quite a few. Um, had a few trips to emerge as well. Oh my! What's, yeah. the, what's the worst injury you've ever suffered? I know it's a cliche question. Oh, I'm just curious. Uh, being bruised from head to toe, I ended up falling on a huge patch of ice that I didn't realize was there. And it was too late for my guide to tell me there was ice there. So I ended up like eating on an ice patch and didn't realize since I didn't realize the ice patch was there and so I wasn't ready and I was still barely new to snowboarding I ended up like falling off like falling on the ice patch and like I couldn't move for like the long it seemed like a really long time but it was only for a few minutes oh and God. then once they realized I had injured myself they wouldn't let me move for like until they like cleared until they like did x-rays and stuff because yeah, they yeah, wanted to make yeah. sure that i didn't like break anything or anything so you ever been it concussed? Was, uh not snowboarding okay well, <laughs> okay what snow <laughs> concussed how <laughs> then when did you <laughs> just a very mild one when i fell on ice walking wow out of all the things yeah. you'd think it of would all be the your, things it, it would you would be... think it would be snowboarding but no <laughs> it was just walking all right well um <laughs> look out for that ice and yeah. uh, obviously your trusty dusty sidekick darling your guide dog yes yes um, your partner in crime there um how long have you actually had a guide dog period is darling your only one that you've had um darling is actually my second guide dog uh and so i've had darling for a little over three years and then my first guide dog, Olivia, who is happily retired and living with my mom now. Hmm. Um, she worked for about nine years. So uh, I would say about I had guide, I've had guide dogs for about 13 to 14 years already. So you just did you try the white cane or did you just go straight to guide dog? I used a white cane for a long time, actually. And then when I realized that I was starting to lose more vision, 
I wasn't as confident as what I used to be and just like seeing like traveling around it, it, it was uncomfortable and I didn't have a whole lot of confidence and couldn't see traffic lights anymore so I was like I need to do something mm-hmm. so um, a bunch of my friends had guide dogs at the time so I reached out to a bunch of them to see what like what guide dogs are and to learn more about them because I knew about them it's like I learned I remember learning about them as a child but I was like I don't know exactly what got dogs too so um i reached out <laughs> they're like gps's funny. that you can program to take you wherever yeah. you want yeah no no that's not how that works <laughs> that would be amazing but no <laughs> that's not quite how that works <laughs> um so i ended up doing a lot of research and like speaking with my orientation and mobility instructor for the CMIB, and i looked at a bunch of schools and stuff and then i was like uh, after I did my research and spoke to a whole bunch of people, I thought it would be like a really good thing for me to have, especially since like I was losing vision and like I wasn't super confident traveling around. So I got a guide, like I applied for the guide dog and it took a little while to like get approved and stuff. Uh, it's about a year long process to get approved up until you get a guide dog. So, um, but when I did get a guide dog and when I was like matched with my guide dog, um, suddenly, I mean, it wasn't like instantly overnight, but like over a short period of time, I realized how much a guide dog actually is super beneficial. Because suddenly I got a whole bunch of my confidence back and was able to go out and not like be as worried or nervous about getting around. And uh, if I couldn't see something, at least my guide dog was there to like uh, keep me safe and um, make sure that I wouldn't run into anything. So, um, yeah, uh, having a guide dog has been, I wish I kind of would have done it sooner had I known Mm. like how, like how beneficial it would have been for me, but it was just, I think it was just before, um, I actually started out at a college. So it was kind of perfect timing. So I'm obliged to ask now that I know you've been concussed (laughs) on ice. Was that before the guide dog days or after the guide dog days? It was after the oh, guide dog Oh, come on. <laughs> it was a silly, like, it was a silly thing. I was walking around and, like, didn't even realize it. Um, I thought it was actually on a, like, I was walking across a driveway of a gas station, and I didn't realize that there was ice on the driveway. And I guess it was, like, I don't know, I think, something had like spilled on the flat like the driveway or whatnot from like the gas station that's ironic a blind a blind woman slipping (laughs) and concussing herself on ice in a gas station where people park their cars to drive i'm sorry i I, I have a terrible sense of humor (laughs) yeah it was just a mild concussion but you know mild oh my gosh and yet you still strap your feet to a board and i do oh man i always joke I can't do anything like I have to do the most extreme things are not going to injure me. And it's going to be like certain simple. It's like walking around. That's going to like be my demise. Cracking a sidewalk is what's going to take you out. (laughs) (laughs) Probably. A fantastic place to end that part of the conversation. Wouldn't you agree? Just shy of discussing Emily's podcast. Don't you worry. Part three coming at you sooner than you realize. I've actually been messaging Emily back and forth um, over the last couple of weeks. And before I hit record on that conversation, I asked her, hey, has anyone taken a good old fashioned radar gun and taken a reading of how fast you were going down the mountain? And she's like, no, never, never. And The last time she hit the slopes, she apparently wears a smartwatch and it can actually measure speed. And she told me that apparently she clocks in at about 30 kilometers an hour for all my American friends. That's a tick under 19 miles an hour. Keep in mind that speed she's going is a training speed. It's not full race speed. And there's nothing between her and the ground but a board and some protective equipment. So... Just to put it into perspective, I thought that was a pretty cool fact to know and pretty freaking quick when, again, there's nothing between you and the ground but a helmet and a snowboard. Look forward to part three, final part of our conversation. 
If you would like to reach out to Emily, all of the links are in the episode's description to all of her social media, as well as her website and her Shredding for Gold podcast. If you would like to reach out to me, you can do so at disenabled.podcast at gmail.com linked in the episode's description and i've also linked the company uh, the company the company euclear's homepage. that's the company that supplies emily with her gear for her guides the speakers that she talked about and the compact as well cool bluetooth technology there so check that out if you're interested a lot of different series of microphones and speakers that were originally designed for ATV and motorcyclists on the trails and snowmobilers. So take a gander if you're interested. Almost done with the self-promotion. Bear with me for another few seconds. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to share it with a friend. Rate the podcast. Constructive criticism. Any criticism, really, would be appreciated so I can continue to bring you better and better quality audio content. I hope you enjoyed listening. And until next time, folks, cheers.